Kathy Pettit, your certified life and wellness coach, and I am here today with a very special guest, Susan Hyatt. And Susan Hyatt is a master certified life coach who has helped thousands of women to transform their bodies and lives. She is the creator of the Bayer Process, the Bayer Deck, the Bayer Podcast, an online community called Bayer Daily, and the Bayer Book. Yay! <laughs> with her fiery Facebook rant, Susan has gained an international following of women like myself who love her honesty, humor, humor, and fearlessness. Susan has been featured in Cosmopolitan, Woman's World, Seventeen, O, the Oprah Magazine, and now she's on the Love Your Life show. Welcome, Susan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. I have been a longtime listener to not only this podcast that you now have going, which is for coaches, which is awesome, but actually it works for any um, woman, I think, out there. But also you have had several podcasts over the years and I've been following you and loving it and it has helped me launch this own podcast. Just get out there and do it because you can change. Thank you, first of all, for listening. And second of all, amen on launching your own podcast. Good job. Just get started, right? And that's, that's part of this whole bear process, getting seen. And you're... I started actually as a personal trainer and then group fitness coach and sort of got into this whole wellness because I was, I had battled eating disorders when I was younger and I was really sick of the messages we were getting from, um, you know, our family and the media and all this, the the patriarchy. And so your message has always sparked a special place in my heart. And then when you started doing the bear process, especially this bear book, I have absolutely loved it, and I'm so thrilled that we can bring this to the listeners. So can you tell us a little about how you got here? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you. That means a lot to me. And um, how I got here is uh, I was already a life coach. I started my practice in 2007, and so it was during the process of building that company that I really realized I knew I was using food in an unhealthy way to cope with emotion and stress and all those things. And I decided that I was going to dive into it and look at it. And when I started on that journey for myself of unwinding food and body issues, I remember being shocked by the fact that being bored was driving most of my overeating, that I was um, picking my little kids up from school and bringing them home and like emptying their backpacks and doing pre-K worksheets and doing all the mom stuff. And it wasn't filling me up like I thought it would to rearrange my life and my schedule so that I could be the one to drop off and pick up. And then I felt guilty about that. Mm. And so in the late afternoon, early evening, I would start overeating to cope with all those uncomfortable emotions. And when I really started to do my own work and take a look at it and became awake to diet culture and a lot of the messages that I received as a child, um, I started helping other women. When I went through that and got to the other side, I added that to my life coach offerings. Mm. And it really, so over the past 11 years of working with thousands of women, um, I decided to go all in on this when my daughter was really, so it was probably eight years ago. She was about 10 and she came home from school one day and she said, mom, every girl at the cafeteria table made a pact to not eat their lunch and go on a diet together. And she said, that's messed up, right? (laughs) And I was like, yeah, that's messed up. And so it was in that moment that I thought, you know what? I'm going to devote a lot of my time to this, not just a little bit of my time. And that's when I started really documenting what I was doing with clients that was working. And then the bear process was born. Oh, I'm so grateful that your daughter had you to come home to because there are other dynamics out there that the daughter would come home and the mom would say, oh, good decision. Okay. Yeah. That's let me help you or something. I mean, that's just where we are. And that is why I think both of us are so passionate about bringing this message out there. And what I really, really love about your, um, your book that I'm going to be, when this airs, it'll be airing in July and we'll be doing a book club on my Facebook live with it, but it, it really is a transformation and it is a change in mindset. We both 
have worked with Brooke Castillo, which is all about the thoughts and it all starts, you know, everything starts with the thoughts and it's that idea that this is not a diet. This is not a three week process or a seven, it is a part of a transformation to shifting how we're thinking about caring for ourselves. Right. Yeah, it really is turning a lot of what we're taught through diet culture on its head. And so, you, you know, many girls and women are taught no pain, no gain, um, and you just need more willpower and all these things we just accept as truth. But when you really start to evaluate your mindset and start to operate from a place of love instead of deprivation, that's when everything can shift. All right. And that really digs right into, you know, one of the main differences with bear and other things we read about out there. Could you tell us a little about that willpower and um, how you approach it differently? Well, I can remember thinking or being told like, well, your diet's not working or you, you don't have continued success with weight loss because you just need more willpower. You know, you're lazy, you're whatever. And 100%. well, I just have to add in there, a lot, a lot of my listeners are you know, middle aged mothers <laughs> or women who were sort of, they come to me and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so frustrated. I used to be able to lose weight in the past, or I used to have, be able to, you know, stay to this strict pack. What's wrong with me now? And right. that's where I just, your book brings such freedom. Yeah, because it's really, you know, you're not broken. Mm -hmm. um, our bodies shift and change. And that's why having an approach where you're paying attention to your body signals and not an external plan is so important. Because as we age, we change hormonally. Um, foods that I could easily digest in my 20s give me hot flashes now. <laughs> um, right? So it's, it's not that something's wrong with my body. It's that I need to power it up with things that work for it at the stage that it's in. And so, yeah, I, I am a 1000% believer that women do not need more willpower. Think about everything we do in any given day and what we deal with. We have plenty of willpower. <laughs> it, it's that we need to prioritize our own pleasure because the body is wired for pleasure. And we tend to, when we're on a diet, live in this deprivation mode that actually does the opposite of what we're hoping a diet will do. Mm, absolutely. Well, and I would argue that a lot of modern day womanhood or mothering has us living in a sort of deprivation mode because of what you were speaking to with the guilt that it's like take care of everything else first and then you know i mean i can't even i know the p word for pleasure was not part of my vocabulary my kids my youngest is now 15 but when you know i had three under 10 there's no way um right right yeah. of course no because we're taught like you know, eat your dessert last, have fun and play once your work is done, say for a rainy day, everything is very much like you can enjoy yourself later. Mm -hmm. And what's actually required of us is to enjoy and um, diversify our pleasure now so that we can be more productive and make more money and all those things. So it's really counterintuitive based on this sort of puritanical, no pain, no gain atmosphere we're raised in. Mm. Yeah, I, I really, I really like that. And then I think there's a, at least for myself, when I, I remember first sort of opening my mind to this idea that not only was I supposed to speak kinder to myself, which I was like, are you sure? Because <laughs> I don't know if that's possible, but then also to look for ways that I could bring joy into my life. For me, the easy hit was, okay, let's, you know, eat ice cream after dinner when the kids have gone to bed, or let's have some wine. And food was sort of that, okay, pleasure. Well, this is like that safety zone because I'm not really impacting the family. How do you help women sort of step outside of the pleasure that's actually not so good for us? Right. I know when I start talking about pleasure, people's minds instantly go to, well, this box of donuts will be super yeah. pleasurable, Susan Hyatt. Um, and so we immediately go to stuff we can consume. Um, so eat or drink. That was certainly me with my wheel of brie and bottle of wine. Um, but also consuming in the sense of, oh, oh, well, I'll go pay for a massage or something like that. And not that massages and, and great food and great wine um, can't be pleasurable, but I was getting almost a hundred percent of my entertainment 
out of the food I was overeating. And mm. I think that that's so common for women because especially if, if a woman has children, because right, we're shuttling, we're the mom taxi, then we come home and we're, you know, there's all kinds of stuff to be done and food is in the fridge, food is in the pantry. It's an easy way to numb out and, and get a little bit of entertainment. But like you said, it's not true pleasure because typically if we're overeating and overindulging in a way that's not healthy for our bodies later, it doesn't feel so great. Like I'm somebody that's, that when I talk about food, I talk about power food and pleasure food, meaning like, let's choose foods that when you're paying attention to your unique body, you know, powers you up. And then of course you're going to have some pleasure food in there. We can't live without cheesecake um, or maybe you can but but what I noticed on Mother's Day was that my husband was so sweet and he bought me a big red velvet cake which is my favorite I was raised in the south and if you've got a good red velvet cake with buttercream frosting like that's my favorite and I had a couple pieces of this cake over the course of the weekend Mother's Day weekend and I it took me almost three days to recover from the sugar coma that, wow. right? Like you were talking yeah. about women as they age, I used to be able to eat all kinds of sugary stuff and be fine, but now my body just doesn't metabolize it well. I, my system is very sensitive. And, and I had to say like, that was pleasurable while I was tasting it, but now not so much. So next time- yeah. I mean, well, I'll have a decision to make like I do with champagne. If I drink this champagne, I'm going to have night sweats later. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe a red velvet cupcake. <laughs> but I, I also find there's that, that question of like, we don't know how good it is to feel good until we remove some of those things. So I understand yeah. aging has something yeah. to do with it, but I used to eat a lot of processed foods or sugars. And so now that I don't, when I have one, I'm much more in tune with my body. And it's, I mean, I, I tease that I, I prefer beer over wine. And I tease that if I have one beer, I'm almost walking into walls. Whereas yeah. I, I drank my way through college. Sorry, mom. And yeah. Dad. But it, you know, it's that. And, but it's because my system, it's not something my system needs. And when I do put it in for that pleasure, I have to, you know, my system's like, Whoa, okay. And it's right. much what more. Is this? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a very cheap date. So that <laughs> I am too. I am too. If I have two drinks, <sighs> Uh, it's it's over. Yeah, You're either yeah. tucking me into bed yeah. or uh, like, you know, that tipping point you have where you're like, okay, I have to make a decision here yes. right now. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> and yeah. so, I, I mean, it, it has literally been years since mm -hmm. I've had a third drink because I, I'm like, you know what? I don't want to feel terrible tomorrow. Right. Well, and I just like to bring to attention that it's not necessarily aging because there's so much around that too with women and aging that it might just be that our bodies were treating them better now. And then when you bring something in, it's like, whoa, see, we're, we're more like those fine tuned motor cars. That, it's, it's a yeah. brilliant point that you make. And, it's, <laughs> and it is true because I now, you know, like, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, when I was not using my body as a guide, I probably did feel like junk. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't connecting the dots that like, Hey, maybe, maybe all that wine wasn't a good idea. Or maybe that, you know, second helping of cake was a poor choice. I was just like, uh, popping some extra strength, Excedrin and moving on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So how would you suggest, you know, for the woman who says that she doesn't have time or money to bring more pleasure into her life, how would you suggest she get started? Well, I actually just taught a class about this early this morning to a group of female entrepreneurs. And, and the, I think the biggest um, myth about pleasure is that it's something that costs money. So yes, you can spend money on things that are majorly pleasurable, but sustainable and truly nourishing pleasure is typically stuff that you don't have to pay for. So mm -hmm. I can provide for the show notes if you want. I have a couple of downloads that have simple pleasures, ideas for people, um, because this comes up in almost every coaching conversation I have about pleasure because they're mm -hmm. like, well, I don't have time for that or whatever. It's, it's like five minutes a day, go sit in the sun with your cat. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how about you get up 15 minutes earlier and have some silence to yourself or 
Maybe what you need is to watch a TED talk. I know mm. when I was describing how I would come home with my kids from school and I was bored out of my mind, mm -hmm. um, what I was really craving in terms of the pleasure department was intellectual stimulation. Mm. And so had I understood that there were many forms of pleasure and intellectual stimulation is one of those and like, hey, you could read a book, you could watch a TED talk. There are a million things you could do to stimulate your imagination and creativity um, that don't cost a dime. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you need comfort, if that's the category of pleasure you most need, give yourself permission to curl up in a blanket and watch a good show or get a hug or right. It's, there's so many things you can do that do not take a lot of time and cost zero dollars that mm -hmm. are deeply nourishing. And listeners, I would like you to consider this a permission slip that you can go do that because it is, I just ate my lunch outside mm. with no phone, no newspaper, nothing, just myself and my, and just, it felt so good. The weather's getting warmer and it's just that like, okay, we're allowed to do nothing. Uh, we're allowed, you know, not right. every minute has to be this like super efficient, crazy land. Um, exactly. Exactly. And I think honestly, you just hit a vein here with this whole conversation because it really does start with women being willing to give themselves permission to do it and being mm -hmm. brave enough to sit with yourself and whatever comes up. Because I know I was avoiding what my feelings were and numbing out with food and alcohol. And when I finally did say, okay, I'm going to feel my feelings today. <laughs> I remember laughing like, like, that's it? Like, that's what I've been so scared of? I mean, we can, we can handle some discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And I definitely will follow up with you to get that um, download. And I also want to tell listeners to check out her book because, you know, week two, you have some great exercises in here to lead into how to find pleasure in really sustainable ways and to find it for yourself, which is what I like. You have a funny story in here. I won't talk about it, but when you purchased your uh, mixer, so readers, you're going to have to get the book to figure that out. But I, I also want to ask you, so you speak of how cleaning your closet or your environment can help you with this whole process. Could you speak a little of that? To that? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that, one of the top three things that when I ask women, okay, so you want to lose some weight, what, what are you, what are some of the first things you'll do if you're at your ideal weight? And women always say, buy cute clothes. Mm. And I am a proponent of like, don't wait until you're a certain size to adorn yourself in a way that is amazing. You deserve to feel fabulous no matter what your scale weight. Um, but one of the things I have them do is go to their closet and take inventory and, and uh, very Marie Kondo-ish, mm -hmm. you know, asking, does this wardrobe tell the story I want to tell about myself? And do, do these items of clothing or shoes or purses or lingerie, do they spark joy? Which is her number one question in her book. And, um, most women, I hate to say, do not have a wardrobe that sparks joy. They have a wardrobe that they think is acceptable, that covers them up, that hides quote unquote problem areas, but they're not dressing and adorning themselves in a way that's a celebration. And so when I have a woman declutter her closet and get rid of everything that either doesn't fit, doesn't spark joy, you know, doesn't help them feel fabulous all of a sudden, you know, they're saving time and energy and money because they're not wading through like, eh, does this make my butt look fat kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes such a difference. And, and that, that's something you see every single day, the closet. So if you mm -hmm. see every single day, these pair of pants that you can't fit into, that's, you know, you, that's just not kind to yourself. Um, and I often say that if you're going to lose the weight, you'll go get another pair of pants. I, I have a lot of people that say, oh, I spent a lot of money on that. Or mm -hmm. I, but every time you see it, you're reminded of this poor decision, you know, that you spent a lot of money on that or that it doesn't fit. The exactly. And I, I think that like for any of you, so most women are, are typically hoarding small mm -hmm. ambition sizes, like mm -hmm. you're saying, like, oh, if I just lose another 10 pounds, I can get back into that. Or what I was doing the opposite was I had stacks of jeans at every size. Oh, so okay. it's like, like holding on to larger clothing because you don't trust yourself oh. that you're not going to gain a bunch of weight. 
And so I am a fan of getting it all out Mm -hmm. and only having stuff that fits you right now and only stuff that you feel amazing in. And I mean, there's, we could spend a whole episode on all the objections women have to that. (laughs) Um, But it's in the, if you do it and read this chapter in the book, it will absolutely, that one chapter could change your entire relationship with your body. Which interestingly, readers or listeners, is the first chapter, the first week of the seven week program. And so um, that, that needs to tell us something that our environment does make a difference. What other ways does, do you find that people's environment affects their life choices? So when I have people do what I call an environmental detox, it's, it's like becoming an investigative reporter in your life and just paying close attention to what are the things I'm tolerating that are coming at me? Um, whether it's obligations, peer conversations, what am I watching on TV? What kind of music am I listening to? What's in my newsfeed on my social media outlets? And just pay close attention to anything that depletes you. And then if it does, then it's time to get to work on that. Because if we can clean up and create boundaries around the things that deplete you that really no longer belong in your space, then all of a sudden you have more time and energy to devote to the rest of the steps of the process and really start taking amazing care of yourself. Okay, that's wonderful. What happens if some of those things in your environment are like your boss or your kid or spouse? (laughs) (laughs) It often is. It often is. So I'm like, listen, nobody's saying go get a divorce. Um, So whatever it is, whether it's parenting issues or dealing with a boss or a spouse, There's always things you can do. You're not trapped or stuck. And it also doesn't mean you've got to like stay away from those people, Mm -hmm. Um, right? Like if you value your paycheck, obviously you're going to have to work something out with your boss. And it's really, honestly, it's really, yes, the other person could be quote unquote problematic, but there are things that you can do no matter what the other person is doing to make your, how you show up and the way you handle your side of the street more effective. So having boundaries. So I used to say all the time, I have two kids. My son, Ryan, I talk about a lot because he, he really is what led me to life coaching. Honestly, (laughs) I'm trying to figure out myself and how to parent this out of the box kid. And I used to think that like, Oh, I, I'm missing out or there's things I can't do because of Ryan. Mm. And what's interesting is that what you think is in the way is the way. So it was through me dealing with my own stuff to learn how to parent from a place of peace that led me to this entire life, right? So if you're blaming your boss or your spouse or your kid, you may not want to hear this, but they, they are absolutely 100% your greatest teacher right now. And the doorway to your greatest accomplishments. Yeah. They've, they've heard it before and I just love it. And I love that you brought that up. I, I, you know, I say that if it triggers you, it's about you. <laughs> and as you know, I mean, that's right. From I love the, that saying. Yeah. I love that. I'm going to um, like, you. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's straight from the thought model. And, you know, like before when your kids were coming home from school and you were annoyed and it's not about them, it's about you. And, and so much yeah. of mothering that has freed me is the idea that we do have choices. Um, I remember my life coach initially had said, you know, I was saying something like, I have to do this, or I have to be with the kids this weekend. And, and she's just like, no, you don't. And I'm like, yes, I do. I'm the mother. And there, <laughs> she's like, no, you know, you're choosing to, you could get a nanny, you could, but looking at, we have choices. And then it really is just sort of this mindset shift. And looking, okay, well, you know what? I'm choosing to be with my kids on Saturday. How can I add some pleasure to this for me? I'm going to stop and get a coffee before we, you know, or whatever it is. I really, Mm -hmm. I really appreciate how your book brings that into focus. And Mm -hmm. also with the gentle reminder for responsibility (laughs) for ourselves and our mindset. Absolutely. (laughs) Darn it. We can't blame it on when you do your environmental detox listeners, like, (laughs) you know, you can make note of who's annoying you, but just know we're coming back to you. Yeah. It's you. (laughs) (laughs) Otherwise we'd all be in closets and just like sitting there (laughs) alone. I want to switch gears a little to speak of how you speak of exercise because I just adore it. And your, um, I'm going to read just from the first page of your exercise book where you say um, that you used to resist exercising so much, you hated it, resented it, et cetera. But one friend, one day a friend said to you, Susan, you have a human body and your body was designed to move. 
you need to move it at least three times a week. And just sort of that idea, again, it's a mindset shift. We're not doing exercise to harm ourselves. Exercise is something we do for ourselves. And I, I think, you know, I'm 47. So I grew up in the eighties where it was like you exercise to just punish the weight off you and it yeah. just like look for the biggest calorie burn. And now shifting into this, you know, lifetime, like I exercise so that, well, one for my mental health, but also for my physical fitness. Can you speak a little of how you view exercise as a woman? Yeah, totally. I, same, same mm -hmm. era. I'm 46. Yeah. And it was, it was definitely exercise was always a punishment yeah. for what you ate. Um, no pain, no gain, all that. And, and I like to talk about movement as a celebration for what it can do. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's dropping the transactional relationship between like, Hey, I will do this workout, but only if I end up looking like JLo by Friday. Mm -hmm. Right. Or I'm only, it's this, it's this transaction that we, we give this unfair deal we make with our body that, Hey, I'm going to move you, but you better shape up. Yeah. And, and that's like, right. Like that's no way to have a relationship with yourself and, and turning it instead of a transaction to be a relationship and coming from a place of love and moving in a way that shows your body that you love it and moving in a way that helps process emotion. And like you said, for your mental health and committing to yourself that no matter what, no matter if you lose weight or not, tone up or not, the goal isn't that you're going to necessarily look a certain way, although that does happen depending on the kind of workout that you do. Um, it's more well, a commitment to moving this creature because we're, we are built to move. And in my opinion, movement is not optional. Yeah, I, that's what I just love. And, and I do think that while that might sound harsh, it's actually, for me, freeing. I, I thought, I, you know, I speak of some things you just set it and forget it. You choose, you're going to exercise. You know, you, you say here, it can be five minutes of exercise or 50 minutes, whatever. Just do something, find some form of exercise that you don't completely hate and just do it. And it yeah. is that, yeah, it's not because you're overweight or underweight or what it is. That is what our bodies are meant to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And it could be gentle. It could be Tai Chi or it could be dancing in your living room or it could be CrossFit or boot camp. Right. Everybody's system and what they need is different. And so it's fascinating to see the or remember the judgments I had about exercising and working out and and how far I've come and how far my clients have come in terms of like, you know what, like it doesn't matter that I just had a cupcake. I'm not going on a run because I ate red velvet cake. I'm going on a run regardless. Hmm. Like there's no correlation between my workouts and what I ate. And I can't tell you how often I've even seen it on my beloved Peloton um, spin classes. The instructors inevitably will say something like, oh, it's Thanksgiving Thursday. So we better uh. go ahead and like pre-burn off these calories and it's like, listen, you can't outrun red velvet cake, so, <laughs> right? You might as well enjoy yourself and move and come from a place of love. Mm -hmm. Well, and so what you just said is the key to it all. And that's this idea to move and come from a place of love. And that is, you know, I have been in that place before where it's like, oh my gosh, come from a place of love. Not only is the voice in my head incredibly toxic, but I look at my body and I'm not. Mm -hmm. And so how do you suggest people start getting to that place of love. Right. So plenty of you listening, I can feel you rolling your eyes. Mm -hmm. I understand. Um, something that I like to recommend in the beginning of learning how to talk to yourself from a place of love is um, we can also provide this. There's a something that I created called the body scale, which is an assessment that you can do to see where do you fall in terms of either really self-violent thoughts to total body positive thoughts, right? And there's this whole range in between. And in the middle is body neutrality. And so maybe your first hurdle step here is to eavesdrop on yourself a couple of times over the next few days and just tune into what you're telling yourself when you look in the mirror, when you're eating, and just notice the quality of your thoughts. And take a look at the body scale and see where you fall on it. You may be at the extreme 
self-violent end where you can't even look at yourself in the mirror and you may be on the positive end of things or you may just aim for body neutrality which is like i don't really care either way um like i'm just happy to be alive it's fine body right i'm in a body um and so for many of my clients they're like you susie in the beginning where what you were describing before that their thoughts are very toxic they can't imagine thinking a positive thought when they look in the mirror Mm -hmm. And just know that that's pretty typical, which is not happy news. And so what we, what the good news is, is what you're thinking about your body, you have been taught and you can be untaught that and you can retrain your brain to think loving thoughts towards your body. Even if right now that seems impossible, you can use the words, I'm open to the possibility that fill in the blank until you get to a place where you do believe it. I love that, Susan. And and I do, I am a true believer because I am, I no longer, I can't tell you the last time I've thought a negative thought about my body. It'll be more like, just more neutral. Like, oh, look at that. My pants are tighter there, but not in a like, that's because my, whatever used to come up. I can't even dream it. It's just more like factual. Like I'm noting something, you know, like that dish isn't fitting in the dishwasher right now. There's no emotional and it's beautiful. And so if I can get here, you can too, warriors. And I need to point out that there's a, this brings me back to the reason why your environmental detox is number one, because so much of what helped me was one, being a detective in my mind, but two, making sure the stuff I was feeding my brain and my eyes were helpful that, you know, so for all of you listeners out there to pay attention to when you get off Facebook, how do you feel when you get off Instagram? How do you feel when you turn off you know, what are you looking at in these different unrealistic <laughs> body types or that are making you think that there's anything less than wonderful about your body? Exactly. Exactly. And I think that everybody, um, Susie, do you remember, cause we're the same age. Do you remember when they first showed us that what Photoshop was? Yes. Like when they, it was like big news, Yeah. like surprise. These models don't even look like that. Cindy Crawford, I remember, was quoted as saying, I wish I looked like Cindy Crawford, meaning the first version. Yeah. And and so now Well, and how she had depression over it because she felt like she should. Yeah. She should look like this fresh version. Right. And but now uh, generations past us uh, or younger than us. Um, they intellectually understand. We intellectually, when we're scrolling Instagram, understand that a lot of those Fitspo mm-hmm. accounts are photoshopped, and we still look at them and compare and despair unless we're willing to curate our news feeds, have all different ages, body types mixed in. Um, and get to a mentally healthy place where you can look at a, a Sports Illustrated or um, an Instagram model's feed and admire, but understand like this doesn't take away from the beauty of my body just mm-hmm. because I have cellulite, which by the way, cellulite wasn't even a thing to get rid of until 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. So like women have cellulite. Yeah. It's, it's what skin does, but about 30 years ago, marketers decided to start peddling, you know, cream, firming cream. And now all of a sudden it's a problem and it's not a problem. No. So warriors, you need to head. Oh, I will have the links in the show notes to Susan's Instagram page because you're reminding me one of my favorite posts of yours is a picture. I think you're in a bikini from behind Mm -hmm. and it says, sell you lit. And it is just, <laughs> yep. I, I was like, woo, free chicken. I show them, I have five boys and I'm like, look boys, this is beauty. This is what a like, body this, looks like. Yeah, yes. and this is awesome. And the more of us that are out there doing that are great, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. leads me directly into your um, final piece here that I just am passionate about also. I love the whole book, which is why we're getting into it. But <laughs> the, the part on speaking up and making a scene, could you speak a little of the importance Yeah. Well, so I saved that for the final, you know, being seen and being willing to make a scene for the end, because I think it takes some energy and some capacity built up to be willing to advocate for yourself. And so really, you know, what I notice among my clients is that practically what's happening. I I was even recently going through old photos because my daughter's graduating from high school 
in two days. Um, and I was going through old photos and I'm not in a lot of them, you know, I, and it's because I didn't like the way that I looked. And so a lot of your listeners may, who are parents may identify with like putting the kids out in front of the family portrait and hiding behind your kids so that no one can see like what you really look like or volunteering to take all the pictures so that you don't have to be seen in them. And so there's that facet of that chapter, which is like literally stop deleting yourself. Mm. You deserve to appear in the memories that you've had. Um, but also the second piece to that is being willing to make a scene, which means advocate for yourself, ask for the raise, speak up in staff meetings, tell your family what the boundaries are, really start asserting yourself and not be so much of a doormat. Mm, I love that. And I just would really like listeners to hear the, the wide spectrum there that you can, you know, speak up at work to that boss that's always been, you know, a bit vocal with you, or you could speak up at work to the coworker and actually say where you want to go to lunch. Like, no, I'd like to go to Panera. <laughs> right. <laughs> These little pieces, like it doesn't have to be this big knock it on the head or, right. um, yeah, you can just choose to let your husband take the picture and you stay in it this time. These are all mm -hmm. little steps we can take. You don't have to jump off the cliff right away, right. but whenever right. we can start seeing that um, I just like reversing that trend of like, be the good woman, be the quiet one. Be, and that is to just start shifting that mm -hmm. um, however we can. And you are doing that on your social media and in your podcast and everywhere. And I am a huge supporter. So I am. Thank you. Huge. I love being a follower of yours on Instagram as well, too. Super yeah. fun. Thank you. Is there anything you would like to leave our listeners with this that we have not covered yet that you think would be a. You know, I just think that the thing I would love to leave everybody with is just be open to the possibility that you can become a woman who takes exceptional care of herself from a place of love and not punishment. Mm. And that it is possible to love the skin that you're in or at least get to body neutral. And I really believe that the book is a great way to start thinking that way and adding practices into your life to do that, which is why, you know, I... I am on this book tour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I am so grateful for you and for the message and we're just shouting it out there. So warriors head out there and live a life that you love the name of this podcast. And we're going to do it with Bear this month. Um, thank you so much, Susan, for coming on the show and keep shouting it out, showing up and being seen. Susie, thank you. Thank you.